So it is a great pleasure to introduce Didier, uh, Didier Pilot, uh, uh, who I used to see a lot when I went to Rio de Janeiro because he was yeah. at, uh, at uh, UFRJ, Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro, until he moved yes. to, to Norway uh, three years ago, I think, three yeah, or four years three ago. Years ago so yeah three years ago, so he's now at the University of Bergen. Yeah. And uh, he's going to talk to us about the global opposeness and scattering for the DST equation. All OK, right. so yeah. thanks a lot, George. It's really a pleasure. So thanks for the invitation. And I know that you have in invited me in person since a long, long time. I, I never could come somehow. So, so <laughs> I really hope that I will be able to come for real <laughs> in the next year. But for the moment, it is the best that we can do, right? So. <laughs> So yes, and uh, okay, so uh, the work uh, I will talk about, so it's uh, on distal equation. And so it's a joint work with uh, Razvan Mosinka, who is postdoc with me here in uh, Bergen, and uh, Jean-Claude So, so who is uh, uh, emeritus professor in uh, Orsay, or no, it's a Paris Sud or Paris Saclay, I never know. So it always changed name, but um, yes, so, okay, okay. So um, the distal equation, actually, it's an asymptotic model uh, in, uh, in the water wave equation. So first, in the first part of the talk, I would like to recall uh, the physical motivation. OK, why, why are we interested in this equation? And um, so I would like to talk briefly about the water wave equation. So it's a very old mathematical problem. Um, it's been derived actually by uh, Lagrange in, at the end of the 18th century. And the problem is to describe the motion of a, of a fluid with a flat bottom here, so at the eight minus h, say, and with a free surface, okay? And so uh, the problem is very difficult because, uh, so here you have the velocity of the fluid, V of xt. X is the horizontal variable, it can be one or two, dimension, but in our case, it would be two dimension. And so the problem is very difficult because, of course, the free surface, it can move with the time. And so the, the free domain is not constant in time. It's moving in time. OK, so, so, so it, it's really a challenge. And it has attracted a lot of very, very good mathematicians. And even recently, there have been a lot of work uh, of very good mathematicians on this subject. But even like that, uh, it seems very difficult, almost impossible to, to, to understand completely this model. Okay, you have, of course, a uh, result on a local well -post nest, or you also have result on asymptotic close to the, to the equilibrium position or on the, the flat uh, uh, zeta is equal to, to zero, okay, the, the flat surface. You have maybe some result on existence of solitary waves, but to get a very general result, it's a super difficult problem. So it has been quite usual, instead of focusing on this big uh, system of uh, PDEs, to derive a synthetic model, okay? So some more asymptotic models that you will zoom in a specific regime. And then in this specific regime, you have an asymptotic model that is somehow easier to study and you can study it and get some information uh, on the system. And then you can somehow come back to, to the original system. Okay, so this is a plan, and uh, which has what I find quite interesting that it has been uh, actually uh, it has been used the first time by by Lagrange. Okay, so Lagrange already used this kind of idea to zoom on specific uh, linear regime in the case of Lagrange, and he, he already was able to get the information on on the speed, the velocity of the propagation of wave, and things like that. Okay, it was a uh, uh, eight, in the end of 18th century, so uh, it was quite quite uh, quite interesting at this time. And uh, of course, uh, no, it has been you uh, it has been used a lot, and so a lot of very interesting models have, uh, have been derived in the step of of, of Lagrange. Some okay, so uh, in order to derive those asymptotic model, you need a small parameter uh, in uh, in terms of which you will derive your asymptotic. So those, those parameters are, are described uh, with respect of quantities of the problem. So for example, you have uh, here, A is a typical height uh, of a wave and lambda is a typical wavelength of, of a wave. 
And so you have the shallowness parameter, mu is h over lambda to the square. And then you have the wave steepness epsilon, which is a over lambda. So there are two uh, important quantity in the asymptotics. And so that's what I was saying. The mathematical analysis of the water wave equation is very difficult. So we would like to, to, to focus on asymptotic models. Um, in our case, we will be in what we call deep water. So it means that the shallowness assumption, which is mu very small, is not satisfied. Okay, mu is just to recall, it's uh, the, the depth of the fluid over the typical wavelength. Okay, so uh, this in our case, it, it will not be small. So somehow it doesn't make sense to derive asymptotic with respect to mu. Uh, this is what you do, for example, in the long wave regime, uh, which you, where you, you derive uh, KDV, for example. So here it, it's, it's not the same kind of problem. And here we are so uh, in a regime that is known as a modulation regime. And so it tends to describe the weakly nonlinear modulation of a train of uh, surface gravity waves in deep water. Okay, so the, the modulation equation, it describes the time evolution of the amplitude of the oscillation of the wave packets. Okay, so in order to, to carry the, to perform the, the derivation, uh, you take a carrying wave vector for the wave packets that you will call K naught. And um, without loss of uh, generality, we can normalize and assume that K naught is EX so in the x direction, okay? This is just a normalization. And so the idea is to consider small perturbation of this wave vector. So k is k naught plus a perturbation delta k. So if you take the modulus of this vector, you have the corresponding wave numbers. And so the assumption that you're doing, it's a narrow bandwise requirement, is that a modulus of delta k over modulus of k naught is small. Okay, and here small, we will take of order epsilon. And so, well, this is quite well, well known. So as a first order, uh, if you do your asymptotic development, then you get uh, a cubic uh, nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Okay, this is, uh, this is um, I don't know, this was maybe done in, in the 60s, uh, but, Unfortunately, so this equation has some physical shortcomings. And so in particular, uh, Benjamin Frey instability for some 2 d sideband perturbations. Okay, so this was uh, uh, observed in the 60s by, uh, by uh, Benjamin, Brooke Benjamin. And so this was really a problem because uh, uh, to use this equation uh, in physics and in oceanography, um, where some of the model were, was not stable. Okay, even if mathematically the equation is a cubic nonlinear Schrodinger equation, it is nice to study. Physically, uh, you, you have this kind of instability problem. And so that's why Dister in six, uh, 79 uh, proposed instead so to go one order further. So he proposed to keep the term of order epsilon square. So he just pushed down the model one order further. And then he got this equation, okay, which may seem a little bit complicated, but somehow physically, this equation doesn't, doesn't share this, uh, this instability problem. And so it seems that uh, in, um, in uh, oceanography, it is really used by people, okay, that, that the NLS has some shortcoming. And so uh, oceanograph really use this equation uh, a lot, okay, for for many things. So physically, this is an important equation. Uh, all that I, I have tried to explain here, it is very well uh, explained in the book of David Lam, for example. So, okay, I'm doing a kind of a, <laughs> a pub publicity. So uh, I think it's a very nice book and there is a, a chapter uh, devoted to, uh, to, to deep water. And then he, he explains the derivation of uh, NLS and then there is a chapter on higher, sorry, a section on higher order models on this equation. Okay, so if you neglect the term of order epsilon square, you just keep the first line, then you got really a Schrodinger equation, nonlinear Schrodinger equation. The nonlinearity here, it's cubic. But here, 
I just would like to observe that uh, it's not uh, Laplacian. Actually, you have a minus sign here. So, well, we say sometimes uh, hyperbolic Laplacian, or you 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 may want to call it uh, maybe uh, D'Alembertian. Okay, but it's somehow uh, what people call hyperbolic analysis. So it's cubic. And then if you take into account the term in of order epsilon square, then here, this is a dispersive term of order three. So you have three derivatives. And the three terms here, it's nonlinear terms. Uh, they are all cubic, but they have all one derivative. Okay. And the last one, it's also non-local in the sense that uh, R is a risk transform. Okay, so in Fourier variable, it just defined as a multiplier by minus I Xi over the modulus of Xi mu. Okay, and um, if you take the Fourier transform, Xi is the Fourier transform of the first variable X and mu is the Fourier transform of the second variable Y. Okay, so the, this is a risk transform. So somehow uh, this two equation, it's a third order uh, in a dispersive equation, it's 2D. Uh, and the nonlinearity is cubic, it has one derivative, but it also has a non local term. Okay, that's more or less what you have to, to, to think when you think about this. Uh, then, of course, uh, this study did it in the infinite depth case. Okay, infinite depth case, but you have also a corresponding version which was derived later in the finite depth case. So it's almost the same equation, but here, instead of having your risk transform, you have an, uh, an operator, which is uh, described as follow. So phi is a potential. So it's a harmonic function on a strip and you have Neumann boundary condition. So on the lower bottom, it's uh, just a zero. And on the upper bottom is a, a DX modulus of psi to the square. And so, well, this is on a strip, so you can really solve it um, by using Fourier transform. And if you do that, you, you will find that your operator, um, dx phi, it's somehow an operator which in Fourier transform is a multiply, multiplier by this guy. Okay, so here it's phi over modulus of psi square plus mu square, and it's an hyperbolic cotangent of this guy. Okay, so formally, when h goes to plus infinity, hyperbolic cotangent goes to one, and so you recover the, the risk transform. So when the depth is going to plus infinity, you recover the distal equation uh, in the inf infinite depth case. So it's, it makes sense. And the, I will really focus on the original distal equation, but there is some all, all that we will do will also apply for this equation. Okay, so uh, this, is all, this is due to this observation that if you multiply by dx, so in Fourier variable, it's just to multiply this multiplier by xi, you get a xi square over square root of xi square plus mu square times the hyperbolic cotangent of this guy. And then if you do an asymptotic development when xi mu is small, you will find xi square over xi square plus mu square, which is obviously bounded. Okay, and this, this is somehow, uh, it kills the singularity that you may have with hyperbolic cotangent. So, so this is for this reason that what we, what we will do will also apply for the finite depth case. Okay, then I will not come back on, on this issue later. Um, another observation that you, you also, also can derive uh, this kind of model in the 1D case. And then in the 1D case, what you get is a, a type of a modified KDV equation. So it's a three derivative. And here you have nonlinearity uh, cubic with one derivative. Okay, but once again, there is a non-local term and psi is a complex value. Okay, but so somehow it's a complex modified KDV equation that you get. And this, this uh, it's a 2D version of this. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is more or less what I wanted to say on the derivation. Of course, it's far uh, from complete. So please, uh, if you want to, to know more, I, I think the book of David Lang is a very good uh, source to, to start about uh, learning about these things. Um, 
Okay, but now I will some more focus on the mathematical theory for this equation. So there is a way to normalize the equation to epsilon is equal to one. And then this is the distal equation we will work with. So once again, it's a, uh, it's a, so at the first order, it's a nonlinear Schrodinger equation with an hyperbolic Laplacian. Then you go one order more, you get a cubic dispersion. There is also a sign minus. It will be important as you will see. And then you got the nonlinearity. You got the cubic nonlinearity of an LS. And then the other nonlinearities, they are cubic with one derivative. Okay. What you can say also is that uh, uh, formally the L2 norm is conserved by the flow. So formally, if you have a solution, then the L2 norm is constant uh, uh, along the time. Okay. But the interesting thing is that as far as we know, there does not exist other conserved quantities. So for example, you do not have an energy or Hamiltonian uh, which is conserved. Um, Another interesting observation that there are actually Hamiltonian version of this equation. So there are some recent work by uh, Craig, Guyen, and Sulem, but there are also other works. Um, but somehow the Hamiltonian, they, they, are, they, they do not control any Sobolev bond, uh, so, sorry, Sobolev norm. So even if you have Hamiltonian, they are somehow useless. Uh, for the to, to control Sobolev norms, so for the global to go from local to global uh, well poseness. They, they may be useful for other things, but uh, not for that. Okay, so somehow, uh, if we want to use this quantity, we have no choice, we, we have to reach the L2 space. Okay. Uh, and this is the best that we can do. So, okay. So uh, in, in this talk, we will focus on the, on the well poseness theory for this equation. Uh, and so before I, I present our result, I, I would like just to make a brief review uh, on the well poseness results. So, um, okay. Uh, uh, the first one is of uh, Anne de Bois, so in 93. And so she studies the local well poseness for this equation in a very smooth class of initial data. So analytic classes of initial data. Then later on, there is a paper by Shiara. So I think it's just a preprint actually uh, on archive in 2004 and uh, he proved local well process in H3. So at high regularity still. Then in 2007, there is a paper by uh, Core and So, and then they prove local well process in H3 over two. And so for that, they, they started to use um, the smoothing effect associated to the linear dispersive part of the equation. Um, then very recently, actually, we were completed this work. Uh, and so uh, Grande, Kuryansky, and Stafilani um, have made some uh, nice improvements. So they were able to prove local well poseness in HS for S larger than one for the distal equation. And then they are proof somehow it relies on the Kenny Ponce and Vega machinery for the modified KDV equation. So they, they complete the smoothing effect with a maximal function estimate and Swickert estimate for the linear group. And uh, this is far from being trivial okay, to get the maximal function. Here you are in 2D, so, 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 so I think it, it was a nice paper. And also in this paper, the, they, they provided uh, ill poseness results in HS as soon as S is positive. So this is in the weak sense. So in the sense that the flow map fails to be smooth. And so this is known in the field that if, if it is the case, then it means that you cannot solve the problem by fixed points below the threshold of uh, L2. Okay. But for some reasons that I will explain uh, in a minute. Didier, can uh, we, I just ask? Can I yeah, just please, ask a couple please, of questions? Please. Yeah. Is is there any scaling for the equation? Yeah. Where, so for, for which you could say, you know, there's clear. Uh, yeah. yeah. So that's exactly that I want well to, to comment. Uh, the point that the equation is not invariant by scaling because of uh, the NLS term here, mm -hmm. uh, and because of this cubic nonlinearity, which has no derivative. But yeah. somehow, if if you remove those guys, then it is invariant by scaling, and the scaling is L two. L2, okay. So, so 
Uh, here another question uh yeah. so so you're in two dimensions but you have a cubic dispersive term which would yeah. probably give you well probably not as good as smoothing as kdv because kdv has the three derivatives but it's just in 1d yeah. so how, how how many derivatives do you gain in that smoothing sort of result Cato so type in, smoothing in, for in the equation? Cato smoothing yeah in, in, in the local equation. in the local smoothing i think yeah. you would uh no, uh, I think you could gain one derivative. I see a full one derivative. Yeah, because Good. I think it's, uh, it's if if I'm not mistaken, uh, we would have to to check uh, the paper of those guys. But if I'm not mistaken, it is uh, the square root of the derivative of the of the phase. Okay. So so I, I think you could gain a full derivative in both directions. Okay. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, so 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 this is a very good point. So I, I wanted to comment on that. That this result actually, this is it could probably be improved to a real ill poseness result below L2, because uh, from a scaling point of view, you are you are uh, below the scaling. So, mm -hmm. so then you okay, it's not been it has not been done, but you you really expect this kind of result. Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, okay, and so uh, now let me present our, our results. So. Uh, it was published this year, actually, uh, in 2021. And so the, the Cauchy problem associated to this test, so we prove that it is globally well posed in L2, which for us should really be the, the critical space. But then we have uh, the restriction on small initial data. But for small initial data, then it is globally well posed in L2. And moreover, you have uh, scattering. So what does it mean? It means that uh, the solution behaves as solution of the linear equation. Okay, for some uh, v not plus or v not minus. So for some profile in L two, you behaves as time goes to plus infinity as a solution to the linear equation associated to those profile v not plus and v not minus. Okay, and so uh, this is this is the point. And then when s is strictly positive then we could have local well poseness for arbitrarily large initial data. But somehow, uh, I will come back on this issue. Uh, for the moment, we don't know how to prove uh, well poseness in L2 for arbitrarily large initial data. Okay. But if it is the case, it will probably, uh, the time of existence will not depend on the norm, but just on the profile of the initial data. So somehow, the, the conservation of the L2 norm may not be useful to, to extend it directly to, 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 to global solutions. Okay. But those are open problem and I, I will try to, to come back on, on that at the end of the talk. But no, so first I would like to make some comment on these results. And then I, I, I would like to describe a little bit the idea of the proof. Uh, okay. So uh, the result is sharp. So due to the poisonous result of Grande, Kuryansky, and Stafilani below L2, it is sharp because as you will see, we were using the fixed point theorem. But we also believe that it is really sharp. As we are commenting, we believe that the problem is really ill posed below L2. So, but this, this remains to be proved. Um, as I was commenting before, the result also hold for the finite depth version of the distal equation. Um, one thing which is interesting is that if you look in the 1D case, then uh, you could use the technique of Koenig, Ponce, and Vega for the modified KDV equation. And then you, you get local well poseness in H1 quarter, but then the equation is ill posed below. So um, let's say that it's ill posed in the sense that you cannot use the fixed points. Uh, of course, for MKDV, you know, you are you have very uh, nice recent result of uh, Kilib Vison and uh, Arab Griffith, I, I think, uh, which improve the result by, by using um, complete integrability techniques. So here, in the in this case, the equation is not completely integrable. So you probably expect that the, the H1 quarter is the best that you can do. So somehow. Oh, sorry, here it is a, a typo. Uh, it's L2 of R2. So somehow our result 
in two dimensions who are better than in one dimension. So it's, it's interesting. Uh, and then I will comment, uh, all of that is due uh, relies on the strict art estimate. So uh, I will comment on that uh, in, in a couple of slides. Okay. Uh, another interesting observation that if one changes the, in the, the higher order dispersive term, you have a minus sign. If you change this minus sign for a plus sign, then you, go, you get a version of the modified uh, zakharov kusesov equation. And uh, interestingly, it also appears as a version of these two equation when the surface tension is taken into account. And then this equation with a plus sign, it has been well studied. And uh, there is a work, I think the most recent work of uh, uh, Kinoshita in uh, uh, 19, so two years ago, and he proved local well pose nest in H1 quarter in R2, but then improve real ill pose nest below. Okay, so if you change from minus to plus, then you ill pose below H1 quarter. So it's, it's a little bit strange because you, at least for me, it was a little bit surprising because first, when I started to look at the equation, I was thinking, okay, this should be the same, but no, it, it is not. Okay, so, uh, so somehow with this minus sign, we do better than with the plus sign and we do better than in the one decades. Okay, and also, yes, uh, for the modified ZK equation, you got previous result by uh, Felipe Linares and Adenia Pastor, and then by, uh, Francis Ribot and Stefan Vento. Um, okay, but the best you can do is H1 part. Okay, so now uh, let me uh, focus a little bit on the on the sketch of the proof. Uh, on the sketch of the proof. So the main ingredient are the following. First, okay, okay. So first we perform a linear transformation. Um, kind of renormalization in order to obtain a uh, homogeneous third order linear part. Somehow we are more comfortable to work with an homogeneous third order linear part. So it really simplifies technically the proof. So we perform this transformation and then work on, on, on the equation we get. Uh, then the idea is, is uh, usual is to use a fixed point theorem to construct a solution of the associated integral equation in a suitable function space. And here we will use uh, the Fourier restriction norm method. So the so-called XSB spaces. Okay. okay, so this function space is constructed through this, uh, this method. So it was celebrated uh, because it was introduced so by Bourguin and also Kleinerman, but then Bourguin used it to, to, pr to, to to really improve the, the, the result on uh, KDV and, uh, and uh, NLS in the 90s and also KP. So, so yes. And so the, the main idea is that we have to prove a trilinear estimate because we have qubit nonlinearity in these spaces. And here we really rely on the on a linear and bilinear strict art estimates. So they are the, the main basic ingredients that we are really relying on. To, pr to prove those trilinear estimates, okay. But then there, there is finally another ingredient. So in the critical space, so case in the uh, L2 case, so when S is equal to zero, then it's not enough to close uh, the, the, uh, the arguments. And then we have to work in a, uh, like some home refined version of the XSB spaces. Uh, which is the atomic U2 and uh, is dual, so the V2 spaces of square bonded variation uh, functions. And in the context of dispersive equation, this was introduced by Kor and Tatao uh, in 2005, 2007. Okay, and those spaces are, are specifically useful in the critical case. Okay. Uh, I think that the V2 spaces actually he was it was already used uh, in uh, by people in row space uh, theory, but as far as I know, the U2 the, the dual it was introduced by those guys. Mm -hmm. uh, so so if I have time, I will I will give a word about those spaces. Okay. Okay. So um, 
first, just a brief slide uh, on the linear transformation is not difficult, okay? Uh, it's just a transformation of this type. Okay, so you have some constant A1, A2, A3. And then if you choose carefully those guys, you can transform your equation. Somehow you can cancel out the, the uh, second order dispersive part. So then you just have a cubic, uh, sorry, um, yeah, a cubic dispersive part. And of course you have your nonlinearity. All these transformations, they are invariant. The, the nonlinearity are invariant through these transformations. Um, and then if you do that, and if you are in the specific case where C1 is zero, so you cancel out the NLS cubic nonlinearity, then the equation is an invariant uh, underscaling. So this is your question, George. And then you, are, you have really, you can really check that uh, the L2 norm is uh, the critical space. Okay, so it's some more justification that our result is, uh, is critical. When I call critical, it is because of that. Okay. Of course, uh, physically, it's important that C1 is not zero. So of course we have to include this, but this guy is subcritical in L2. So it's not, um, it's not a problem. Okay, so now, uh, in what follows, I will really focus on, on this one. Okay. okay, and also I, I focus, so this is really, in my opinion, this is the main uh, reason why we have better, a better results than uh, if I change the, the, the dispersive uh, part with a symbol plus and than in the 1D case. It's because the strict art estimates are better. So somehow when you increase the dispersion in this case, Sorry, when you increase uh, the dimension, in this case, you have better estimates. And a nice way to see it, there is a general result by uh, Carberry, Koenig, and Zisler. And so what they prove, that um, it's an harmonic analyzed result, but you can rephrase it in the, in, the, in the setting of dispersive equation. And so if you have a group, a unitary group with a symbol, uh, Omega of psi mu, which is an homogeneous polynomial on R2 of degree D. Okay. Then you are able to recover, if you have a Stuckert estimate in L4 for the propagation, you are able to recover one over eight of the determinant of the Asia of, of the symbol. Okay. So in our case, um, well, W psi mu, the, the, the phase, the, Yes, yeah, the, the phase, it's uh, in Fourier variable, psi three minus three psi mu square. Okay, so you have this minus here. And so here it is a straightforward computation. You can prove that the determinant of the Asian, it has a sign. Okay, so it is uh, constant times psi square plus mu square. Okay, so here we leave the, the three in order to have a nice constant here. And so some O, you are able to recover one over eight of this guy. So it's a one quarter derivative in both variables in L4. Okay, and this is, this is a, the main part. Okay, so this is here. Uh, D is a derivative, homogeneous derivative in both X, Y. And you are able to recover one quarter of derivative in L4. If you change the sign of the, the, the dispersion, here you would have a plus. Then if you compute the Asian, you would have a minus instead of a plus. And so somehow you can recover your derivative, but you have a problem in a, in a section of, of a cone. And then this is what happened for, the, for ZK, for example. And then you have a, always a region which gives you trouble. And that's where this guy Kinoshita constructed this counterexample. So here you can really see that if you change uh, the dispersion by a sign, then you really have a different behavior uh, regarding the, the, the local well -postness. So I think it's quite interesting. And this is also, if you want to do that in 1D, you just recover one over eight derivative. So, so that, that's here so that you crucial, can do better. So what's crucial is not so much the homogeneity of the, of the symbol, yeah. but the Hessian, the Hessian, yeah, right? Exactly, completely. This is the Hessian. So, so it's quite interesting. And, uh, but the, the nice thing that it was homogeneous that you could use directly this result by, uh, by, by those guys. So then it was like a black box. You know, you have the result, you can use it. But yeah, you, you're right. So, so it's not, uh, if you put a plus, then it doesn't work. So, so I think it's, at least for me, it was not that obvious. So, 
And somehow this is why it is better than in 1D also. So, so I think this is, in my opinion, one of the main part of, of our paper. It's not that difficult, but somehow it is important. And um, well, I will come back later on, on the definition on those spaces, the XSB spaces, but somehow you can transfer these estimates in the XSB setting. Okay, so I will explain that bef after, but just for the record, so uh, PN is the localization in dyadic spatial frequency. And here you see your gain of one quarter of derivative uh, in this setting here. Okay, but to be completely fair and honest, what I should say is that this estimate in the special case uh, of this symbol, it could already follow of other former work. So uh, this is a, an observation by, by Felipe Linares. And actually it was already in a paper by Kenny Ponce and Vega in 91. Okay, so those guys have done so many things <laughs> that sometimes it's difficult, you know, the, the papers, are, there are many, many results. So it's difficult to record all of them, but. But so Felipe recalled that and he was completely right. So, so actually this result in this specific case, it was already uh, included in this paper and also in the later paper of uh, Bernard C. Corenzo. Okay. Is that so, the one where they do the oscillatory integrals? Yeah, and the, it's the, the one and the at the Indiana investment. University Journal. So this 91 yeah. paper. So, so do you know vaguely the, how that proof goes? Is that something like uh, stationary phase methods yeah. and, and stuff like that? Right? Exactly, That's where you get exactly. The hash yeah, exactly. So the point that, uh, uh, yeah, because so it, yeah, yeah. So but here, here it's a little bit more tricky because you are in two D, right? Mm -hmm. So you are in two D. So but somehow they, they are able to to study uh, the Asian so in two D and and they are, they are able to do the proof in two D also. But it's not as easy as, than in one D. Okay. So but, yeah, because uh, usually, I mean, the Hessian shows up when you do stationary phase yeah, on oscillatory but, integrals and stuff like that. The, but the it, it, is, it is exactly the case. Exactly the case. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. So, yeah, so you, you have plenty of different, if you want it, follow of plenty of different proof. This paper, I think it's nice because they study an homogeneous polynomial in general, and then you can really compare if you want. You can. But, uh, but in this case, uh, you could use directly the result of Kenny Ponce and Vega. And Ben Artico and so they are classify any polynomial of degree three in R2. And so they have, uh, they're using normal form. So they're really, so it's a very interesting paper also. So they are classifying everything also. So, well, you, you could use either of those results and, and you would get this result. Okay, very good. So, so this is one thing. Uh, the other ingredient will be uh, the, so in the context of the Fourier restriction norm method. And so now I would like to describe a, a little bit. Uh, so sometimes you call, you call this space Bourgain spaces. Okay, so uh, I would like to describe them um, here a little bit. So the idea that you're taking the Fourier transform of your function uh, both in the space variable, so x, y, so then you got xi and u, but also in the time variable, and then you got this uh, tau. Okay, and then you you're putting two indexes, so the s is nothing else than the spatial regularity, so it's like when you work in a Sobolev space, hs if you want, but then the b, it's a coefficient you put here, you put a, a a B on this weight here. And here, if you want, this is the linear uh, transformation. Uh, sorry, this is the Fourier transform of the linear uh, equation. Okay, so the DT is a tau, and then this is the, the symbol, uh, the dispersive symbol here. So some O the B, if you want, you will penalize how far you are from the linear solution, if you want. So if you put a B, which is I, then if you are very far from the linear solution, you will pay a high price. If you want, this is the spirit, I think, of, uh, of, of Borda. Okay, so here in our cases, uh, this is our phase function. So this is the symbol uh, in Fourier transform of the dispersive uh, linear term. Uh, <clears throat> this is nothing else than the, the, the Euclidean norm of xi mu. And this is a Japanese bracket, which is one plus modulus of xi. Okay. And so uh, in general, so it is well understood in, in the theory 
like wh wh when Bourguin introduced those spaces, the fundamental observations that you have a very nice simplification of what uh, people call the resonance relation. So you're looking, for example, uh, here we have a cubic nonlinearity, so it's a trilinear interaction. We want to look at this guy, W of Xi1 plus Xi2 plus Xi3, mu1 plus mu2 plus mu3, minus W Xi1 mu1, minus W Xi2 mu2, minus W Xi3 mu3. Um, in 1D, for example, for KDV, you have a nice factorization of that, and you, you can do a lot of things. Uh, similarly, if you want to look at bilinear interaction, uh, it's this resonance relation. Okay. But here's the, the difficult point that we are in 3Ds, uh, sorry, in, in 2Ds. And so uh, it's not obvious at all that you, are, you will have a nice factorization. Uh, okay, because you, uh, well, I think a lot of people have worked on this problem, at least for the ZK equation when you got a plus, and it's far from obvious. Okay, to understand, actually, you can have relatively big region where uh, this resonance relation, uh, re relation cancels, uh, cancels out. So for example, uh, you have a hyper plans, so where it cancels out. So, so it's quite tricky. Uh, I would like to, to mention, however, that uh, very recently there have been uh, a very nice paper of Kinoshita and then in 2D and then Air Kinoshita in 3D. And they are able somehow to understand the zeros of the resonance relation for bilinear interaction. But it's quite an involved paper. Okay, but this is recent. Okay, so but somehow we would like to, to avoid uh, that. So to avoid understanding those guys. Okay. And so the idea is that instead of working with this resonance relation, so in particular with the bilinear, we will. Uh, work with the derivative of this resonance relation. And some of the derivative of the resonance relation, it will factorize much better. And by doing that, we will be able to recover something uh, that we call bilinear uh, Strickert estimates. Okay, so for bilinear interaction, we are able to recover something without understanding the whole resonance relation, but only the, the, the derivative of the resonance relation. Um, and so let me try to, to explain these estimates. So Pn of u localize the spatial frequency, um, the function around the spatial frequency dyadic n. And then Ql of u localize the linear symbol of distur around the dyadic frequency capital L. And so these estimates read as follows. You have a <clears throat> low frequency interaction. So one of the two frequency, N1, is much larger than N2. Okay. And then uh, you look at those guys in L2. Um, and somehow you are able to recover one big derivative. And then you lose one half of a small derivative. Okay, So it's really a gain of one big derivative. So it's quite important. And then you're paying a price of a one half of of L1, one, one half of L2, but this is quite usual, these kind of things. So really, this is, this is uh, uh, the gain, okay? So one big uh, spatial derivative and you lose one half of the smallest, okay? And I will not go into the proof, but the proof somehow is just to use a Cauchy-Schwarz estimates and uh, older, so it's not difficult. And at some point, you have to estimate a region in, a, in Fourier variable, and somehow to estimate this region, you, you, you use that the derivative of the res resonance relation, it's bounded by below. Okay, so you have to do two cases. Um, you know that uh, Xi1 mu1 is much larger than Xi2 mu2. So in the case say that uh, Xi1 or mu1 is much larger than, uh, than the other one, then if you compute the derivative, you see that you have uh, Xi1 square minus mu1 square. So one of those two guys dominates. And if say Xi1 to the square dominates, it will also dominate this one. So at the end of the day, you recover uh, your big derivative to the square. And then when you will take the cauchy schwarz you will take the square root of this guy and that, that's how you recover the big derivative. 
When those guys are of the same order, then the ID is to derive it with respect to mu one, and then you got psi one mu one. So you also recover a big derivative. So I, I don't want to say more because then it becoming technical, but this is, in my opinion, the, the main idea. But that's only a local, a local uh, dyadic type of, of streaker estimate, like yeah. the ones that Bourgan did for the KDV, right? You exactly. Cannot, so you and then get Taos, a... these things. So somehow, if if you say uh, I have a two estimate, I just put each one in L four and I use a streaker estimate on each one. Mm -hmm. This is a just streaker estimate. And here, in this case, where the frequency are one is larger than the other one, then you 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 can use this trick. And you're completely right. This is a as, as usual in the field, this comes from Bourgain. Okay. So, <laughs> but it's uh, one of those, I mean, because sometimes you have a fully global streak arts estimate that you inject into the, into the Bourgain no. space estimates, right? No, no, but this then you, have this, this you, you just have this kind of Bourgain or Nikolai Tsvetkov's estimates in dyadic blocks. They're not yeah. global, they're just local in, 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 this is in, the, in the polyvinar, and, sort of, in the, in the little wood poly, sorry. And then you have to sum up everything, yeah, yeah. in the little wood poly. But in it, the this is really poly. the idea, and you're completely right, this, this, this came from Bourgain, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and so, no, uh, with those, uh, so really the, the basic block is that the, linear streak art estimates, and then you are able to recover one quarter of derivative. And then the bag linear streak art estimate, and then you are able to recover one big and you lose one half of a small. And now you, you can really look at your trilinear estimates that you want to prove. So this is an estimate on this form. Uh, and so here, uh, what, something which is important, that I don't care about the specific structure of the cubic term. The only thing I care about is that it is cubic and it has a, known, uh, a derivative. So here I will just, uh, as you were mentioning, I have an estimate like that to close and I will do dyadic decomposition in both the uh, spatial variable and also what I call the modulation variable, which is a dyadic variable uh, of the linear symbol of the equation. So the NJ and the LJ. And so we do a dyadic decomposition and then we want to derive estimate and then we sum up everything and, and we want to be able to sum up and to close our estimate. The point that here, so I'm focusing on the most difficult case where I have three terms and I can say that say N1 is smaller than N2 is smaller than N3 and the derivative small, uh, falls on the larger frequency which is the most difficult case. And then I, I don't care about the specific structure, but uh, because at the end of the day, everything is in L2. So, so I can use Planchel and, and I don't care. And, and this is the idea. So somehow what I have to, to prove in, is an estimate like that. Um, okay, I have this multiplier here, which tell me that I have, uh, here I am at the HS level. I have the right to re absorb a S in N1, N2, N3, and I have to pay with one big derivative. And here it is uh, the multiplier for the LJ. And somehow you would like to work with nu is equal to zero. So you would have uh, minus one half, one minus one half everywhere. But somehow to close the fixed argument for the fixed point theorem, it's not possible. So you have to, to leave a new, very small positive. This is technical, but you have to do that. And it will be important in the critical case. Uh, okay, and so this is the spirit of the estimate. So you have, uh, um, it's a four linear estimate because you use duality here. Okay, so somehow you, you want to estimate those guys. So say you are in L2, S is zero, so you just have to recover one big derivative in L2 and you are four guys. And you want to come up with a product of four function in L2. And so then you have to split the cases. So one possible case and where you have two small frequency and two large frequency. And then the, the idea, so it's basically the integral of the four function. You put two in L2 and two in L2. But so you mix them you put one, one low frequency, one high frequency in, in L2, and then one low frequency, one high frequency. 
And then the idea is that for each one, you by the bilinear structured estimate, you are able to recover one big derivative and you pay with one half of a small. So at the end of the day, uh, you have recovered um, one big derivative and it is enough to, to absorb the, the derivative in the nonlinearity. So then it works fine. Of course, you have to be able to resum everything. So you have to have your new positive. Then uh, if you are in the case of one small derivative and three big, you put the small derivative with one big derivative in L2 and the other two you put in L4. So similarly here, you lose one small derivative, you recover one big, and here you, you, you recover one quarter of a big, one quarter of a big. So at the end of the day, it's the same, you recover one big derivative and you are able to absorb the derivative in the nonlinearity. And finally, this is a, really the difficult case, which is a resonant case where all the derivatives are large. And in this case, you can really see that you can cancel out your resonance relation in this case, even in 1D. So this is a difficult case. And here you have no choice. They are all of same order. So you cannot use bilinear estimates. So you have to put them, the four of them in L4. And here you see that that's why you can reach L2 because you recover one quarter of each one. So you recover one big derivative and you can absorb your big derivative. If you, you would have only one over eight, then you could just reach H one quarter. So it's just to do the computation. So this is really, I think the, the main point here, it's a L4 record estimate and that we are able to recover so much because some other relation was signed defin defin definite. So I think you can really see it here in this case. And so somehow in the critical, in the subcritical case, uh, we have some space because S is strictly positive. So we can uh, sum up in the variable LJ and absorb a little bit in the space. And then we can sum up everything and close out uh, the estimate. But somehow this is not true anymore in the critical case. So in the critical case, you cannot work in those XSB structure. It won't work, but this is, um, expected, okay? So uh, in, in other cases, in critical cases, it doesn't work like that. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, in this case, that's what you have to work in a more fancy space. And so uh, this is the space introduced by Core and Tartaro, this U2, V2. So I, I'm not sure how long, how much time do I have? Uh, I'd say five minutes. Yeah, so look, maybe um, I do not want to, to spend a lot of time or, on these spaces. So if you're interested, you can really um, have a look in the paper. Uh, but I think really, I, I would like to insist about that. They are important. So the, the idea of the estimate is exactly the same, but some of this estimate is a kind of, I, I like to see them of um, like BMO H1 duality. So, and then, you know, that's where the, and, so well, if in bending doesn't work in an in a, in infinity, but then it works in BMO. So somehow you have, a, you have a duality like that, and then you can still resum everything. So I think this is really the main idea. So it, it's, a, it's very beautiful, okay? Well, it's, it's, a BMO, it's a BMO H1 duality, but squared, right? Somehow. Yeah, somehow. exactly. And then they put that in the context of XSB. Okay, so, so yeah. it, it, it's very nice, okay? It's... A, uh, to be very honest, uh, we spent some time, you know, to, to go through all the details and to understand all of that. But I think it's really worth to do it uh, when you are in the critical case, it really saves, saves the day. So, so I think it was quite important. And um, there is, I think I would like to insist on, on this paper by Adak, R and Cor. So it's a paper at uh, Annal de l'Institut Henri Poincaré. And they treat the KP2 equation in the critical space. And so they, were, they, they needed these results. And then they have really formalized everything. It's, everything is very rigorous and it's very well written. So that's really the paper we use to learn about, all, all, about this space. And I think it's, it's a really a nice paper. So, so for us, it was important. But of course, if you have questions about these spaces, I, I would be happy to answer. But I think I, I prefer to spend some time on open questions because I think there are a lot of open, interesting open questions 
on the Dister equation. So one uh, is for the arbitrarily large uh, data uh, well, well posed as in L2. So this is somehow we were not able to do it uh, yet. So we expect that it is true, but then the time of existence is probably depends not on the initial data, but really on the profile of the initial data. So if you want, it should be a little bit a similar result to the Kasnav Weissler result for NLS uh, in the critical case. So, so I think this would be uh, important to have this result. Uh, then uh, you have a question on the dynamic on the solution. So either you would have global well posedness and scattering for arbitrary large initial data in L2, or you have finite tab load. Okay, so here, what you expect, you expect actually, because it's a kind of defocusing case, so you expect global well posedness and scattering for any initial data in L2. But I just would like to insist that this might, this may be a very difficult problem because actually the question is not even clear uh, at the first order model, so for the cubic hyperbolic analysis. So uh, it seems that there is a paper uh, claiming to prove these results, but people are not convinced by the proof. So several people with whom I talked, nobody is convinced by the proof. So it seems that even in the cubic hyperbolic analysis, it is an open question, so it's probably difficult. And then of course, for this two, you have one order further. But I think that in the long run, it is an important problem. Um, then of course, we would like to study, for example, the Hamiltonian version of this two, see if we could do similar things. Uh, and also you have a more physical kind of question, but comparison of this two with other, you have other higher order full dispersive NLS equation in the book of David Lan and try to get this comparison. But so I just, yeah, I wanted to say that there are plenty of open problems. I think it's an interesting equation uh, and it has not been studied a lot. So, so I think there are still many things to be done with this equation and people really, so people really use it in physics. Okay, so it's, it's really famous in oceanography. So people use it because it doesn't have the shortcoming of the cubic analysis. Okay, so I think uh, I, I will stop it and thanks a lot for all for your attention. Thank you.